Father, we commit this time into your hands and pray that you will have your way and speak to us by your spirit and through your word. In the mighty name of Yeshua. And everyone said, Amen. 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 So I got till, till one, right? So um, just to quickly, in the very beginning, uh, you know, practically, Aharon was uh, speaking about how through uh, our congregational website in Indiana, the pastors very kindly, we've already sent uh, $7,000 in cash that's, that's actually gone into the, directly to Messianic Jews, pastors, whether they Baptist, Pentecostal, Messianics. In fact, uh, we have a Messianic family from Kiev, from Kemor, staying in our apartment uh, where Tatiana's mom stays for a few days on the way through to a few families, right? Or like, like a family stays for a night and then they move on and another family comes. My point is that, that literally um, all, it's really a miracle because all of the money, 100%, we pray it's going to continue this way, with no you know, overheads, nothing goes directly to these people. And then they have the system of transferring it to different people's banks, bank cards if they're too far away, like even in Kiev. If people have needs in Kiev, they can transfer it to their bank card. They've got a different system to here. So it's very practical and it works. So that $7,000, the first thing that we sent, and I'm sure some of you gave to that. You know, I mean, I don't look at who gives, so just who gives, we give God all the glory. Um, so my point is, this is, you know, a lot of people say give to the Ukraine. I mean, not here. We know that everything that's given here also goes directly 100% to the source. But there's a lot of pleas for funds. And if they're really truthful and honest, they have no guarantee it's going to get to the people. It's going to sit in some bank account because, I mean, literally, you cannot believe how complicated it's gotten. You know, even also just on a practical side, because of Russia being boycotted and Ukraine not, um, like Western Union, they just blocked all sending and they're actually cutting off food from Ukrainians because they think they're boycotting Russia and you can't explain to them there's no time, you have to sit on the phone for three hours, which I don't have, that this region of the Ukraine where the funds are going to, um, is a, it's a refuge. There's no war there, there's no... This is the place of refuge. This is where the funds need to go, but it's blocked through Western Union. I mean, it's horrible, you know? So thank God we have a method, a system where it goes directly where it's supposed to go. Okay, so um, I guess you can, I'll just mention it, but you might forget it if I just tell you the name of the congregation. Um, but it's New, New Creation Fellowship, New Creation Fellowship in Granger, Indiana. You say, where's Granger, Indiana? It's a few hours from here. <laughs> and uh, so it's new, NCF Granger, you can look it up. You, you will see Pastor Arnie. Uh, and his wife, Mindy, you'll see a, a photo of them on the front page, so you'll know that that's the right church. And then you, you just click on Give, and then Missions, and then under when you, when you give, under Missions, just put Ukrainian refugees. And uh, he's, you know, we, we, we just do this together, so 100%, as long as it's it designated Ukrainian refugees. And it's beautiful, because we're helping our Messianic brothers, we're helping whether they are uh, charismatic you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you know what I'm saying? Pentecostal Baptists, uh, they're humans. They are brothers and sisters. Amen. And so we don't discriminate because I, I don't believe in discriminating and giving. And, uh, and, and literally needs are being met on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So, so thank you so much. Uh, it really, it's, it's really, really huge. Um, can I just have some of my water, please, there, baby? Um, thank you so much. I actually wanted to... Before I go into the message, I wanted to open with a scripture that it's, you know, it's interesting. I know Aaron's like this because he's very spirit-led as well, but, you know, sometimes you're going in one direction and, you know, the Lord's already given me direction for this morning, but then all of a sudden he'll just give you a scripture. And the whole time during the worship, the Lord was just reminding me of a scripture. And so here's the scripture and I'm going to read it to you and it's very, very pertinent to the situation that we're in now. So it's Ezekiel 11, and it's verse 16. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have, of course, I'm speaking about Israel, although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, I have scattered them among the countries, just listen to this, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them 
in the countries where they have gone. In the countries. Now, America is one of those countries. The Ukraine is one of those countries. And then it goes on, and it's so very important because there's actually a few places in Scripture where it shows the same concept, the same principle, where notice that in the countries, in other words, in the diaspora, where he scattered the Jewish people, that he will be a sanctuary for them, a little sanctuary, a lot of terminology, and the Hebrews also, I'll be a holy place for them. So it could be either in the Hebrew, I just love that, but a little sanctuary, a holy place is a little sanctuary. In the countries where I've scattered them. And as we were in the presence of God today during the worship and the Torah portion and everything else, and I literally felt in my spirit and physically that this little, this scripture, not, it's not little scripture, I mean it's a little sanctuary, but this scripture is being fulfilled right here and right now through Bess and Messiah. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that in the countries he'll be a little sanctuary. And as Aaron was speaking, you know, this morning while we were getting ready, uh, my wife put on the, the direct uh, online or whatever you call it to, to Kemo, and they dancing and singing and as if nothing's happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, it's just like another Shabbat, you know? <laughs> and I mean, they didn't stress. They didn't look terrified. They didn't, you know what I mean? They're just dancing and doing whatever they do at Kemo, waving flags, praising God, you know? I mean, nobody would dream <laughs> what's, what's going on outside, you know? And so in the nations where he scattered them, God is creating little sanctuaries. And so, but, but here's what's very important, what I want to emphasize. that and, and we see this, I don't have time to go into it now because it's not the main subject today, but it's very important and pertinent, especially with us doing outreach. Um, but also in Ezekiel 37, if you look at it line by line, verse by verse, you'll actually see that it speaks about the same principle. What is the principle? That God saves Jewish people in the Gentile nations, prepares them and equips them, and then... Now, not, this, this doesn't happen with... And I realize some Jews get saved in Israel. I'm not saying this, it's not a formula, but the Bible speaks about it. And then he sends them to Israel. Because if you've spent any time living in Israel, then you know what it's like to be a believer in Israel. It's much harder to get established in Israel because of the constant pressure that you're under than it is like in a, in a, in a, in a country in the diaspora, like America or the Ukraine. You understand what I'm saying? So, and not, not only is this, well, let me just read the next verse because it says there, and that after what I've just read, when it says he'll be a sanctuary in those countries, it says, therefore, thus says the Lord, I will gather you from the peoples, right? In other words, out of the diaspora, assemble them from, so obviously, you know, it's very self-explanatory, where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. So do you see, there's even here, it's even chronological. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we, we are really seeing this phenomenon. We didn't see it in 1948. That's why you've got to look at Scripture very carefully, line by line, verse by verse, because in 48, with a, literally an exception of a handful of people, like Arie Bar David, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, he actually said his family were believers in 1948. And I think there were like 10, 10 or 15, I think it was 10, about 10 families max in 1948. I mean, they were like, you know, they weren't, they weren't freaks in God's sight, but I mean, to the rest of the Jews, they were like freaks, you know. <laughs> They had to literally flee Jerusalem because the Orthodox physically tried to kill them. You know, so they had to go to Haifa where it was safe. Um, so Israel came in unbelief into the land, like 99.9%. .9 and God delivered them in their unbelief. I mean, that's a, that's, you won't find that anywhere else because before the Jews would repent, they'd pray, they'd come back to God, then he'd bring them to the land. In this came, they came into the land in unbelief. Why is this very important? Because now it's like we're seeing phase two. And it's like in this phase two, God is saving and discipling Jewish people outside of the land, getting them strong, getting them established, and then sending them into the land. So not only is it a prophecy, of course, when it's a prophecy, that means it happens, but we see the outworking of it very practically. I'll even give you a couple of names, Israel Poshtar. He got... And, you know, he got saved, established, and discipled in the Crimea, in a church. And he was already a strong, established believer by the time he came to Israel. 
Um, Mikhail Samsonov, also from the Ukraine, he was disciple under Boris, uh, Boris of Kiev Messianic Congregation, Rabbi Boris. Uh, he's one of the strongest, most solid believers I've ever known. And I know it's outside of Tel Aviv. I forget the name of the city. It's maybe Petach Tikva, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, he, uh, well, let's put it this way. A few months, when we last spoke to him a few months ago, when we had some time to speak to him, he said 100% of his congregation were people who got saved through his ministry in Israel. Like 100%. No transfers. There was no to be transferred from. There was only unbelievers there. <laughs> transfers didn't exist. They didn't know that like, transfers meant like a, you know, sending a, a book in the mail or something. That was a transfer to them, you know. Um, and so, so what, what they did and what they do, you know, Ulpan in Israel, for those of you who don't know, Ulpan is where you learn to speak Hebrew. The Israeli government provides the service, but it's only six months. And after six months, I mean, some people who are amazing linguistically, they're very strong. Um, my, my Hebrew is very, how can I put it? My pronunciation is excellent. Israelis think I'm fluent until they start babbling at 100 miles per hour. I'm, I'm just good at Hebrew because I started learning it when I was three, but I'm not a natural person with languages. Like Aaron, I mean, he's definitely a natural with his Hebrew. So my, my point is, some people, it takes them longer, right? It takes them longer to learn the language. So after the six months, all pun, and that's it. And then they're just thrown into Israeli society, and they still speak more Russian than Hebrew. So he created an ulpan for free <laughs> at, his, at his fellowship, and almost all of them got, get saved because he teaches them in, uh, he teaches the scriptures <laughs> and the prophecies. Uh, very good way to learn Hebrew. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there's many examples. You know, uh, you know I'm just speaking of a couple that, that I know of. Um, but, but we see this principle of Jewish people getting saved and discipled in the nations. And where, where does it happen in these little sanctuaries? And this is one of them. Are you guys seeing that picture? Isn't that beautiful? And so this, this outreach, which I believe is the, is the beginning of many, not only many outreaches, official outreaches, but a, a way of thinking. You know, that's why it's so important what Aaron shared, what Alan Binger shared, that it needs to become a way of life. I mean, yes, it's great we're designating these two days. I mean, it's, I mean it couldn't be... God's hand couldn't be more upon it. I mean, his, his hand's upon it completely. But we need to be ready in season and out of season. Even me and my wife in, in Indiana, where we go, I don't know why, there's a lot of Orthodox Jews coming there in Indiana. Um, I don't know what the reason is, but it's happening. And we're in Trader Joe's, and we see an Orthodox Jew. We're in Costco, we see Orthodox Jews, and we just think, oh, if only, before it was, if only I had one of my books, but I, mean, I can't walk around with books under my arm, you know, hoping to meet a Jewish person. But to have a few tracts, now there's no excuse. <laughs> Are you guys following me? So, um, so you know, eventually, you know, after this weekend, you know, I'm sure they'll be made available to you. Um, and, but that's why it's good to have this time of instruction. So not that we need to be afraid of making a mistake because, you know, in the process we'll make some mistakes. But we don't want to be like a bull in a china shop at the same time. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, just, we, we don't want to be fearful. We don't want to be paranoid, obviously. But we want to, we want to have wisdom. You understand that if the if the gospel offends them, then let the gospel offend them, but that it's not that it'll be the gospel offending them, not us. Do you understand what I'm saying? So on the one hand, we don't have to be afraid of that, but at the same time, we do need to be sensitive. And so, so the reason I don't have a, in fact, you have those tracks there, right? Um, I just, I know I'm going to be teaching on this for two hours, but I I teach on this for up to twenty hours, so it's not like I'm going to run out of material after thirty-seven years in Jewish ministry. Um, but I just, just give me the one that says, we want Messiah now, if you don't mind. But it's, it's just, it, it's a conversation piece. And you start a conversation and it's an open door, just like what Aaron did, like, right? What, what Alan Binger did, uh, he just said, like, especially amongst the Orthodox, they are just longing. They talk, now they talk about, I know we talk about the Lord all the time, but they talk about Messiah almost as much as we talk about the Lord Yeshua. They just don't know who he is. So the very front says, we want Messiah now. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you just say, well, wouldn't it be great for Messiah to come? Or wouldn't you like to know who Mashiach is? And of course, so, you know, we, you got the interest. Now the interest level might change, and it opens. But here's the amazing thing. Here's the amazing thing. 
is, you know, when we first started coming out here, especially working amongst the ultra-Orthodox, me and my wife just braced ourselves. We just like, we're going to do it anyway, you know, even if it's our last, what's the word? Our last, uh, last hurrah. Well, I don't know what the term is that you use. But you know what I mean? It's like, we're, we're prepared to go out in a, in a blaze of glory if necessary, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, but, but we, we prayed. We had people praying for us. I remember the very, very first time we went to Monzi, you know, just the two of us. And we were so surprised the very first day that we went. How, I mean, I, I understand it was an answer to prayer, but it's been every time. How every single one that we've spoken to, how ready and receptive and open they were. I mean, it shocked us because we were ready for, I don't know what, I don't know what we were expecting, you know, because we, we have, the problem is we have this image in our minds that we need to start changing. Yeah. You know, oh, they're going to be so offended and upset. And yes, there are cases that there are. You know, if you went into the street and started shouting, maybe they'd just be offended, you know. But, but every place has a different strategy, a different way to reach the people, you know. And every single person that we spoke to, I don't think there's one exception. There was, there was one time we were sharing with a guy and then uh, an Orthodox woman with her children came past and they heard us talking about Yeshua and they got interested and then she really got angry. I mean, they were like, like started screaming at us. But that it wasn't even the person we were witnessing to. But they overheard us witnessing to another Orthodox Jew in that mall, that huge mall near here. I forget what it's called. Yes, exactly. But every person the Lord has directed us to, they have been hungry and open beyond words. In fact, the very first person when we went into Monsi, uh, what's that? That we witnessed to, we were just amazed. At the, at the openness, at the openness to the gospel. And so I just want to say that, that if, and that's why we're so grateful to have people praying for us during this time, those that are praying uh, and leading prayer on, online. So, so thank you so much. And uh, we, uh, we're just so grateful. And this is one of those sanctuaries that I believe is going to be a place of preparation for Jewish people who are going to make Aliyah to Israel. And I believe it with all of my heart, like 100%. So, uh, so also this, this area, this region where we, where we are giving to many of the Kemal families that have fled out of Kiev, you know, that are staying, you know, in different locations overnight or sometimes for a few days. Um, that region of Khmelnytsky, God has protected that region. And we knew that that was going to happen. Uh, when I say we knew, I just, I, in fact, I was looking at my, at my, sometimes I'm, during I'm having a quiet time and the Lord will say, show me something, have me just write it down. And I actually wrote down that the Khmelnytsky region is going to be a sanctuary, sanctuary when people are fleeing from Kiev. And I thought, did I really write it down or did I just think that I actually wrote it down in my journal? And so, so that region, it's turned out to be that way. It's turned out to be that way. And so it's not only outside of the Ukraine, but at this point, this place is still... A sanctuary. So, um, well, let's jump into the word. So, the title of my message doesn't sound like a very encouraging title, but it is encouraging. You'll find out. Is night is coming. Night is coming. That's the title of the message. John chapter nine and verse four. This is Yeshua speaking. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Let that sink in. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. If you believe the scriptures, which I know you do, that's what a believer is, right? It's someone who believes the scriptures. These are the words of Yeshua that night is coming when no one can work. And, you know, last year we just really, I mean, it was a miracle our God even arranged our schedule that we could do this, but we really felt like we should be in the Ukraine for five months. And, you know, before that we were there even without a vehicle and the Lord provided a vehicle. I won't go into this, the story, but... It was supernaturally, he ended up giving us a vehicle for under $10,000. It was a 2012 Volkswagen CC. <laughs> and 
and with 67,000 miles. And we drove over 7,300 miles around the Ukraine for five months. And I, I, I mean, I, I think I wouldn't be able to count how many places we preached. And every place, I, I think without exception, we were warning people to repent, to turn to the Lord. Especially in regions where a lot of Jewish blood was spilt, where there was a strong spirit of anti-Semitism still, we warned people to repent on behalf of the nation and even on behalf of the church for Jewish blood that was spilt in that region. And somebody texted me from South Africa, part of our prayer team, and said, I just see you like Jonah in Nineveh warning the people to repent. And it's really interesting because the first time that I was preaching, I thought, I don't want to be your token Jew telling all the Gentiles to repent of what they did to the Jews because I'm like, Lord, couldn't you choose a Gentile to do this? It's much easier, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And I absolutely wasn't planning on doing it. And I think I shared this before. And somebody sends a text to the pastor. I thought it was the pastor himself. But someone sends a text to the pastor saying, tell him to tell people to repent of Jewish blood. And I thought, wait, if the pastor's telling me, (laughs) the pastor's telling me to tell people. And so I just preached my heart out and God moved in such a way. And it turns out that the pastor's, was it his father or his grandfather? I think it was his grandfather, was, uh, I don't know what they call that group, but basically a Cossack. They had a new modern name, the anarchist or something. They would kill Jews. They would kill Christians. They would kill everybody. They would just kill whole, whole villages and decimate them. And he was the grandson. That was his, his grandfather. So he repented. His congregation repented. And so we were going around. We were right on the war zone. I think I've shared this last time we came. I don't know if I did or not. But I shared this already. So, but, but here's the point, because this is part two. It's one thing to share, and of course, you're trusting God and believing. But every region where the believers repented has, that has thus far been absolutely supernaturally protected. Even that region right on the east, they were literally waiting for tanks to come into that region specifically. And not one tank, not one, I mean, it's like nothing happened there. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, there's just no, there is no natural explanation. I mean, they literally waiting for the tanks to come pouring over the border, nothing, nothing. Every family that needed to escape from that region in all those congregations where we ministered, They've all escaped, those that wanted to escape, they've all escaped to safe places, not even one hair of their head being touched. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it it is so real. The scripture is so real. What? A little sanctuary. I will be a little sanctuary to them in the nations. The same in the Khmelnytsky region. And again, yes, I've told you the story. I've told you the testimony, but you haven't heard part two. This is part two right now. It's the practical outworking the, the bishop of this whole region in Khmelnytsky, everyone said, oh, he's so anti-Semitic, he's this, he's that. And, I, I, you know, there are some that are, and, and I'm sure there was some remains because of understanding that. And I, and I won't go into the story because I'll be repeating myself, although some of you haven't heard it. But, you know, it was about two years ago, and we just clashed like crazy because everyone, they just, oh, he's anti-Semitic. Like, just stay, oh, unclean, unclean. You know what I mean? And just give up on him. Well, thank God didn't, God didn't give up on me with my issues. Amen. And I'm like, I saw him, and, you know, he looked like a hard-headed Jewish guy. I mean, turns out he's partly Jewish, didn't even know it. Hard-headed, stubborn, but deep down, such a heart, such a heart and, and finally, because he said to me the, night, the, the next day we met in the place where there was a, a mass grave where Jewish people were killed. He said, the whole night I've been arguing with you in my mind. And he had a counter argument for every argument that I had. And I said to him, just be quiet for 10 minutes. To get a bishop who's a really good preacher to keep quiet for 10 minutes. To get any preacher, including myself, to be quiet for 10 minutes, it's hard, right? Because that's our calling. You know, we call to preach. But he he was quiet for 10 minutes and he received and he is a completely transformed man. Their their church is now a sanctuary for Messianic Jews and Gentiles, their church. Uh, My wife's brother Vadim, when he prays, you think 
Aaron's got a loud voice, you wouldn't even hear, he would drown out Aaron's voice. I mean, he, he shakes, I mean, the whole neighborhood shakes. I think every demon in a 10-mile radius runs away. So, you know, it's a relatively conservative Pentecostal church and Vadim's there in the, in, you know, in the, in the, I don't know if you call it the basement or whatever it is where the beds are, you know, where people are staying. And he is praying so powerfully, the pastor doesn't want to leave, the bishop. So he comes there and he was like against anything Jewish before. And then your brother asked him for a shofar or he said, so he said, oh, we don't have a shofar in this church. <laughs> he was so spied, he didn't know what to do. He went around looking for a shofar. <laughs> and he saw there'd be not just a bunch of people just making a big noise, but those Kemo people are, are like bringing a prayer revival to Khmelnytsky region now. And this bishop, he didn't want to leave. He just joined in the prayer meeting. He didn't quite know what to do. <laughs> But he just joined in. He just knew the power of God was so great. He just wanted to find a shofar. You see, work while it is still day. And now God is scattering those. I don't know, some are going to Poland, some are in the Khmelnytsky region, some are going to Germany. A good friend of ours from Kemo is going to Germany. Oh, I'm sorry. I use these terms that people think it sounds like chemicals or, you know. Uh, <laughs> Kemo is Kiev Messianic, it's an acronym, Kiev Messianic Congregation. And uh, I stand corrected, but I think I'm, I'm right. I think it's the largest congregation in the world, definitely in Europe, but I think in the world. Because um, they have, I think, just Kiev alone, of course, many have left now in this situation, but Kiev alone is uh, 2,600 approximately. And then they have sister congregations, not only in Ukraine, but in other nations. So it's, it's a lot of, a lot of, lot of people. Um, and they have congregations in Israel, at least three, I think, minimum three in Israel. Um, and so, why is this so important? Because God has literally called us to be a light. God has literally called us to be a light. And, you know, I know that because I'm in touch with Aaron all the time, I know there's a prayer revival that is beginning right here as well. And you know, it's really interesting because it's really God's pattern. Because if you look at Ezekiel uh, chapter 12, verse 10 and onwards, I will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication upon the inhabitants of Judah and of Jerusalem, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And again, I love it. I love that the scripture is very chronological in many cases. What's the first thing that happens? The spirit of grace and supplication. And then what? They shall look. I understand it's like, it's like a dual prophecy in the sense that it will literally happen when Yeshua returns, like physically, but then it's also in the spirit as well. First what? God pours out a spirit of grace and supplication upon us, right? The believers for the salvation of Israel. And then they look upon. Are you, are you, are you following me? And so very, very recently, I won't say who, but someone very, very close to me, um, his brother just passed away and he was very young. Amazing guy, but not a believer, Jewish, of course. And, um, you know, raising up prayer teams and we praying and people are praying all around the world. But I said, you know what? It's great that we're praying and God hears every single word, every syllable, but you also have to bring the gospel to him. I said, you have God, because he just said, well, I'm just going to say, tell, tell him that God loves him and I love him. I said, that's great, but that's not going to save him. That you love him, it's great, but it won't save him because you can't save him. That God loves him, well, you know, the Mormons also say God loves you. You understand what I'm saying? Who are you talking about? He needs to know that Yeshua, Jesus, is the only way to the Father. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent Jesus, and there is no other way to have your sins forgiven except through the blood of Yeshua. And so it was absolutely supernatural how God opened that door because the doctor said, oh, you've got to be quarantined for seven days before you can go and see him. I said, no, he doesn't have seven days. So that's not going to happen. And so he took authority in prayer over, over Satan and all these silly rules, you know, that whatever, you, know, you, get, you see what I'm saying. And three hours later, he said, I'm with my brother. <laughs> three hours later. Shared a clear, crystal clear gospel message. He couldn't respond because he was in, you know, almost in a, you know, just really two day, one day away from going to, you know, to, from dying. 
But I have absolutely, the Lord gave me a scripture and even before that, I have absolutely no doubt. I know he heard the gospel for sure, but I have no doubt that he received. So work while it is still day. Why? Why is it so urgent? Because the night is coming when no one can work. You know, it's interesting, when, you, when you're moving in the Holy Spirit and you're really emphasizing something, um, it's just like in that moment, like you're just completely caught up in that reality and it's all you can think about. And I'd actually forgotten that this happened, so my wife actually even had to remind me. I mean, you can imagine the stress we've been under with trying to protect family and find places for family and, and friends and fellow believers to live and how to escape out of the country and into safe zones, so... I, I'd just forgotten about it, um, but let me just turn to the scripture for those of you who have your Bibles with you. Um, Proverbs 24, verse 11. Proverbs 24, verse 11. And, you know, it's one of, you know, because the Bible, I mean, there's a lot of verses, you know, in the Bible. And a lot of people that live, I don't think, maybe I'd read this verse, but I'd never sort of noticed it. I didn't even know it was there. So before we went to the Ukraine, um, for that five-month period last year, that five-month stint, the Lord gave me this verse. Deliver those who are drawn towards death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. I mean, it's really interesting if you do a word study on this, but I don't have time to go into all the, the different ways that this is emphasized in the original Hebrew. But uh, I was speaking to Rockland Church last night, the Chinese church online, and I said, I'm just curious, what does it say in the Chinese translation? I was just curious, you know, you, you want to make sure, because I speak in so many, well, I don't speak in many different languages, but... I speak to different language groups. And so I've learned to be sensitive to make sure that what I'm saying is getting across. Because sometimes their Bible translations are different. So it's really interesting. He said, whatever it says in the Chinese, it says the picture is literally like animals going to an abattoir or a slaughterhouse. You call it an abattoir in America? Like a, okay, so it's, I don't know why in South Africa they call it an abattoir, but a slaughterhouse. So it's literally, that's the picture of helpless animals like herded on, on, you, you know the picture of that, right? Even of the Holocaust. That literally people being herded, headed for the slaughter. So the Lord gives me the scripture before we go to the Ukraine, and I'm like, Lord, that's, that's a pretty heavy scripture. Like, what am, what am I going to do with that, you know? And the Lord showed me there's going to be war. And it's going to be very, very serious, and a lot of people are going to die. And you have to go and warn people, and you've got to do mass evangelism. This is last year. You've got to do massive, man. you've got to reach the masses. Every time we passed a military establishment and I would see these young soldiers, they look, I mean, not look like kids, they are kids. I mean, they're teenagers in early 20s. I mean, they're just kids, you know? And I mean, it would break my heart. I mean, I don't even have words. I mean, it just would turn my heart inside out. And every pastor, every bishop, every leader, and my wife just reminded me, I don't think there's one excluded. I said, we have to do mass evangelism now. We have to. It's urgent. And they all received us in the sense that I preached in all their churches. They, we still close friends, everything. But not what, every single one of them, without exception, had an excuse for mass evangelism. And it was normally something to do with COVID or, or the city this and, and COVID and now is not the time or the weather or it's not a good time. It's like, do you think I'm joking? Do you think I'm driving around Ukraine in a... 12-year-old car, you know, 7,300 miles, sleeping anywhere and everywhere, they'll give us a place to sleep. Warning, you think I'm doing this because I've got nothing else to do because it's just entertainment for me? Seriously. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? And yet they had a, a huge political, whatever it was, with, a, with an orchestra, with the mayor coming and doing a speech, and, and that was all outdoors, and, you know, hundreds of people coming to listen, but they didn't make time for the gospel. And yes, I preached in the churches and the Messianic congregations and a few people got saved here and a few people got saved there and thank God relationships are established, you know. But not one took that word seriously. Now is the time for mass evangelism. Now, now, like it's urgent. Now, 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 now. 
Now, I didn't know the timing. The Lord didn't. I just knew it was urgent, like very, very urgent. And they thought, oh, maybe next time you come. That'll be better. When you come next time, next time. When there's corpses everywhere, bombs blown out, buildings blown out. And so, I am no prophet. I'll never claim to be a prophet because 99% of people who claim to be prophets aren't. <laughs> we're really honest. Um, they're saying peace and safety when there is no peace and there is no safety. And oh, the war is going to be short and it'll be finished soon and we'll have victory soon. I mean, I think almost every prophecy I've heard has been proven to be false. You know? Um, but if, if, if a prophetic word comes and it's not combined with a strong call to repentance and to receive Jesus. Yeah. It's just, I don't know what it is. I mean, it's just a news, news, I don't know what it is, news comment. I can also commentate what Fox News and the Jerusalem Post says. That's not being a prophet. That's just news commentary. Just look at the Jerusalem Post. You'll get the same information. It's always combined with a call to repentance. Hallelujah. We want Messiah now. That's the cry. That's the cry. Now, I don't know the exact month. I, I, I get a bit confused with timing. But whenever it was, it was either last year or the year before. Either, either last year or the year before. Um, thousands and thousands upon thousands. That's how I got to witness to an Orthodox Jew from Muncie, and I really had his attention because he knew that of ultra-Orthodox Jews who came to the Western Wall crying and shouting out, we want Moshiach now. It's important because some of you know that, some of you don't. But it's like on the forefront of their thinking right now. You know, it's important you know that. So, so before we close, we're going to close in a few moments. Um, I'm just going to read this track to you because you need to know what you're giving out, right? We want Moshiach now. This is a very popular phrase amongst my Jewish people in our times. This simply means we want Messiah now and not later. Enough waiting. The Jewish people are waiting for the promised Messiah to come and to deliver Israel from her enemies, which are many. Iran has threatened to destroy Israel from the face of the earth, and no one from the United Nations even complains or objects. Yet they complain about Israel and vote against her time and time again, for imaginary human rights violations. Yet they don't object to North Korea that drives, that, that drives uh, steamrolls over Christians or blows them up with rocket-propelled grenades for sport. They don't object to China that imprisons and kills Christians for no reason at all. They don't object to the Palestinian authorities who make it a crime punishable by death if one of them converts to Christianity from Islam. Anti-Semitism is on the rise worldwide and it seems that justice eludes us while we wait for Messiah to come and deliver us. We need Messiah now. But here is the good news that Israel has been waiting for over the centuries. Messiah has finally come, but we did not recognize him because we did not understand how he would come. We did not know what to look for, but it is not too late to embrace our scriptures and our prophets once again. If we are honest with ourselves and with God, we as Jews have rejected every prophet that God has sent to warn us back to him, to warn us to turn back to him, I'm sorry. There is not one single prophet that we did not reject or persecute. After they died, we built their tombs or memorials to their names. But while they were alive, we could not bear to hear their words to call us back to God. And I'll just put, 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 uh, go down here for the sake of time. Do we not realize, oh, okay, here, this is about Jeremiah. On at, least two, on at least two occasions, we threatened to kill Moses. We threatened to kill Jeremiah on a few occasions, and our leaders threw him into a well filled with sewage. Yet now we honor him because we recognize that his words were and are the very words of God himself and are now part of our scriptures. Do we not realize that nothing has changed over the centuries? and that we have once again rejected the greatest of all the Jewish prophets. His name is Yeshua, or Jesus, as we know him in English. He is the greatest of all the prophets, 
yet he is also the Messiah and the Redeemer of our people. Yet we have failed to recognize him. Our very own King David says this about him in Psalm 22, about 1,000 years before Jesus was born on this earth. He says, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Anyway, you get the picture. I won't read the whole thing for the sake of time. But it's such a clear presentation of the gospel from a Jewish perspective. And then what we would, as in the church, what we know is the sinner's prayer. It's a prayer to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And thanking him for, for our Messiah. You, you see where I'm, where I'm going with this? So I don't know what the future is, is and I, I sure hope it's not like when I warned them in the Ukraine and then eight months later, there were literally Russian tanks surrounding the city. I hope that's not true. <laughs> but whatever is true, whatever's going to happen, we need to be ready. And you are set up. I mean, wow. <laughs> You've got a synagogue like a few miles from there. And one of the fieriest preachers in America trying to keep the two of us quiet, I mean, they won't be able to stop us. <laughs> and your voices, each one of you. All I know, friends, is that the time is short. I don't know what short means. When I said it was short in the Ukraine, I didn't think it was eight months. I mean, trust me, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, I thought, oh, it's coming, we should get ready. Maybe the next time we come, we'll do mass evangelism. I didn't know it would be eight months. I really didn't. But now, while we have the opportunity, what, I'll tell you what I do know, that God has made this place to be a little sanctuary. Why? Because he is the little sanctuary. Or the, like I said in the Hebrew, he is the holy place that they can come to. That's what they all want. They want the Beit HaMikdash, right? They want the temple, right? They want the holy place again. They, want, they always talk about Shekinah. I'm not sure they know what Shekinah is, but they, they throw that word around a lot, by the way. They're always talking about Shekinah. It's like, seriously, you want the Shekinah? I, I think... We need, some, we need some time to get ready for the Shekinah because <laughs> I'm not sure we'll be standing if we see the Shekinah. That means the Shekinah glory, by the way. And so those people spiritually, thank God not physically, at least not now, you know, for any of us, but they are like lambs headed for the slaughter. And so deliver those who are drawn toward death. How? By bringing them the gospel and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. Hold them back. How do you hold them back? Every, every occasion, we'll, I'm going to talk about it more in the training, but, but every occasion that the gospel is shared, it's always coupled with a warning, don't reject this message. It's always coupled with a warning. It's not just God loves you, Jesus loves you, Yeshua loves you. That's great, that's true. But God is also righteous. God is holy. He's not only the savior of all men, Yeshua is the judge of all men as well. And so you admonish, you warn, right? You preach, you proclaim the word of God. What an opportunity. What a, I mean, you know, Paul speaks about a godly jealousy. I have a godly jealousy for you guys. For me and my wife to, you know, to be in this situation, every time we see a Jewish person, we're just praying. You know, in Indiana, we get so excited. We pray for everyone. I mean, if we had to pray for everyone, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do anything else. <laughs> You know, God's even opened up a door to the Assembly of God Church here, where the pastor's half Jewish. His mother's Jewish, 100% Jewish, grew up with Jewish people. But he says, but we don't reach Jewish people. I said, but that's like living in China, not reaching Chinese people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't avoid them. I mean, how can you not reach yeah. them? You know, but he wants to. So, so, so we're going. We're going. Hallelujah. Why don't we all just stand? Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are merciful, that you are gracious, and that you are good. Father, especially being here, Lord, I, I literally, it's like just seeing people being drawn towards death spiritually, like stumbling to the slaughter, just stumbling, Lord, and 
And thank God, this, it's not like on trains like in Nazi Germany, but spiritually, it's, it's actually the same thing, but spiritually. They're on these, in these spiritual cattle cars of death, headed towards an eternity without Yeshua. And so, Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we've agreed, and many will be praying that this outreach will reach those, Lord, that we've prayed, that, that whose hearts you've prepared already, whose hearts you have touched already, whose hearts you've touched already, that'll just be hungry for this gospel, for these words of eternal life. But right now, um, just, if you don't mind, just one minute. If you don't mind, just, I want you to do that, but just one minute. I just want silence just for a moment. Um, if there's anybody in here and you haven't made your peace with God. I didn't know there's going to be eight months and the city will be surrounded by tanks, like I told you. Not just that city, but other cities too. But I don't know how long you have, how long any of us has. So I just ask you today, if you, if you're not, if you haven't made your peace with God through Jesus, through Yeshua, to not waste any time because you might not have tomorrow. I'm not saying, I'm not predicting anything at all. I'm just saying you might not. We don't know. We don't know. So if you're not ready to stand before Yeshua, and if you haven't made your peace with him, just come out of your chair right where you are, and I'm going to pray with you. If there's anybody here.